Perfect. It is my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker today, Ansuman Satpathy. You may know him as the founder of Cartography Biosciences and scientific founder of Immuni. And on the academic side, he's the assistant professor of pathology at the Stanford University. He was so kind and agreed to talk to us about the epigenetic mechanisms of T cell exhaustion, the topic we just started talking about, and we're about to learn much, much more. Thank you, Ansuman, for joining us today, and please take it away. Thank you, Monica, for that nice introduction and for the invitation to share some of our work. Can you see the slides? Yes, we can. Great. So it's really a pleasure to, to be um, presenting in this forum. I have attended this meeting many times. It's a, it's really a wonderful, wonderful group and happy to uh, be part of it. So what my group is generally and broadly interested in is developing and applying high throughput genome scale technologies to really understand fundamental aspects of how the immune uh, system responds to cancer, in particular in the setting of cancer immunotherapy. We think about this at multiple scales and using multiple technologies. For example, we use single cell technologies like single cell RNA-seq to understand the constituent cells in an immune reaction, for example, in the tumor microenvironment. We try and pair phenotypic information from single cell sequencing with orthogonal genomic data in the same cell, for example, TCR sequencing to understand antigen specificity of a T cell or lineage trace. We try and understand the gene regulatory mechanisms underlying particular cell states using single cell epigenomics or other epigenetic methods. And then we try and synthesize all of that information together to rationally design the genome engineering or gene editing of immune cells so that we may improve their immune responses to cancer. And then we not only think about immune cells, but also the tumor cells themselves using some of the same technologies. And I'll try and touch upon uh, most of these topics today uh, briefly, uh, really focusing on the process of T-cell exhaustion, as we've um, just mentioned. So I think over the past decade, we've really seen a transformation in the way that we think about treating cancer and actually treat cancer in patients, rather than using agents that are targeted towards cancer cell proliferation or survival or death or uh, uh, things like chemotherapy, radiation, or even targeted agents against genetic drivers of cancer cells. In many patients and many cancer types, we now treat patients first line with agents that target their immune system, uh, as we've just heard in the last talk. And so the idea is that we can treat patients with immune targeting agents that then rev up their immune system to increase recognition, increase killing of, of uh, the patient's own tumor cells. Perhaps the uh, exemplary example of, of this type of therapy are so-called checkpoint blockade agents. These are blocking antibodies against inhibitory receptors on killer T cells that uh, release their inhibition in the tumor microenvironment and allow them to more effectively kill cancer. Uh, the best examples of checkpoint agents are PD-1 or CTLA-4 uh, antibodies uh, developed by, uh, originally by Jim Allison and Tsuku Hanjo. These have um, shown us really uh, dramatic and, and incredible responses in a subset of patients. You know, responses in stage four disease uh, lasting for 10 years or longer. However, um, despite that promise, the reality is that many patients and many cancer types do not respond to this type of therapy. And so what we and many others in the field are trying to understand is what are the mechanisms that are underlying an effective and strong immune response to PD-1 blockade or other such immunotherapies? Uh, and what are the reasons why a, a, a patient with a similar disease and similar demographic and, and health status might not respond to the same agent? So can we really understand the fundamental properties underlying these effective responses and then use that as inspiration to develop combination or improve therapies? And our focus has really been using genomic technologies to try and unearth these underlying principles of an effective immune response. The first evidence that we had that this approach could be valuable was in the setting of a cancer called basal cell carcinoma. Uh, as many of you may know, this is the most common cancer in the US, about 2 million new cases a year. 
It is a skin cancer. It's generally UV induced with a high tumor mutation burden. And one of our close collaborators, Ann Chang at Stanford, performed one of the first monotherapy PD-1 blockade trials in patients with advanced BCC and showed that about 50% of the patients actually responded uh, to this, uh, to PD-1 blockade. We felt that this was an opportunity for us. There are several features of this disease that uh, enable us to study it quite easily and quite, uh, quite in depth. And that is that is it, it's a, the tumors are relatively large and they're superficial. And so you are able to isolate tumor cells or tumor biopsies uh, pre and post therapy from the same patient from the same site. And so what we thought now several years ago was that we could use this experimental setup from this clinical trial to really understand some very basic questions about how the immune response was reacting or responding to PD-1 blockade. You know, very basic questions. What is the diversity of T cell phenotypes that actually exist in the tumor microenvironment? Is there one type of T cell or are there many? What are the T cell types that are actually responding to PD-1 blockade? How many of the T cells in that tumor microenvironment are actually uh, uh, proliferating and clonally expanding in response to the, the drug? And importantly, where are these cells coming from? And uh, are they present in the tumor pre-therapy or are they coming from elsewhere, from the tumor periphery to infiltrate the tumor? And again, really trying to understand what are the principles of the cells that are fighting the tumor effectively? Where are they coming from? What's their molecular makeup and, and programming? So our approach, and this was really led by a terrific graduate student at the time, Katie Yost, uh, was to sample these patients pre and post therapy about two to three months apart, isolate the tumor cells, tumor microenvironment cells, dissociate them into single cells and perform paired RNA and TCR sequencing on each of the cells. And so what I'm showing you on the bottom is a reduced dimension dimensionality plot of all of the T cells in all of the patients put together. And what we, we were immediately surprised by was really the diversity of T cells in the tumor microenvironment. It wasn't just tumor killing activated CD8 T cells, cytotoxic T cells. It was really the full diversity of T cells that you might see in any other uh, immune reaction across the immune system across diseases. Uh, on the left, you can see all of the different flavors of CD4 positive T cells. And on the right uh, of the UMAP, really the full spectrum of differentiation of CD8 T cell activation, effector response, memory response, and even exhaustion, which I'll talk about in a moment. On the right, I'm showing you the same UMAP, but now colored by whether we obtained paired TCR alpha beta sequence in each of the cells in which we obtained the transcriptome. And you can see that the whole map is blue, indicating that we obtained paired information for the majority of the cells. So what can we now do using this paired information? The first question that we can ask is what percentage and what phenotype of cells are actually responding to checkpoint blockade? And again, we were surprised that it was really a small fraction of the T cells that were responding, proliferating, clonally expanding post-therapy. Again, we we're looking at pre and post-therapy samples matched in the same patient, so we could make that comparison. Um, so what you can see on the left plot is that really uh, there was this particular phenotype of cell called exhausted T cells. Uh, CD8 T cells that were clonally proliferating and expanding to PD-1 blockade. And this really made up about 2% of all of the T cells in the tumor microenvironment. We could then pair those cells that were clonally expanding with other information about the cell from the transcriptome. For example, we could identify markers of tumor specificity, and we could identify other markers and a global gene signature of T cell exhaustion in those same cells. So what this indicated was happening was that cells were responding to PD-1 blockade, clonally expanding, seeing the tumor antigen, becoming chronically stimulated, and then becoming uh, exhausted. The second question that we could ask is what I proposed in the beginning, which is where are these cells actually coming from? Are these cells that were in the tumor microenvironment that were somehow being inhibited by the tumor cells themselves? And if you give PD-1 blockade, now they were reactivated. Or were they brand new T cell clones that were not present in the tumor microenvironment and were now recruited post therapy from the draining lymph node or from the systemic circulation? And in the vast majority of patients, what we saw is the latter that if we asked of the clonally expanding T cells post therapy, 
how many of those T-cell clones, again, using the TCR alpha beta sequence as a clonal lineage trace, how many of those T-cells were in the tumor pre-therapy? The answer was very few. And so the idea is that a large part of the response to checkpoint blockade, PD-1 blockade in particular, uh, is, uh, is derived from T cells that are being activated outside the tumor and now being recruited to join uh, this anti-tumor response. So why is this the case? Why are pre-existing T cells, antigen-specific T cells that recognize the tumor uh, and entering this exhausted T cell state, why are they not responding to PD-1 blockade? What is it about their phenotype and gene regulation that's not allowing them to enter back into an effector response? And we have recognized that T cell exhaustion occurs for, for many years. And I think we haven't quite understood the molecular makeup and the molecular programming of these cells and, and understood what that means for their subsequent response to PD-1 blockade or any other uh, in, inflammatory or infectious or tumor setting. And very basically what T cell exhaustion is, is if a T cell continues to see antigen in a normal immune response, a T cell will, will encounter antigen, eliminate that, become activated and develop into an effector cell, eliminate that antigen and then develop memory. And that is the basis for vaccination and all of your effective immune responses. In a setting such as chronic infection or tumor where the antigen doesn't go away and it continues to be present and persistent and stimulate the T cell, what happens is that the T cell upregulates a gene program that uh, tries to limit the inflammation seen by the organism. So it upregulates, uh, upregulates a number of inhibitory receptors, it downregulates its proliferative potential, its potential to secrete effector and inflammatory cytokines, and uh, uh, develops into this pathway of T cell exhaustion. But what we wanted to understand is what is the epigenetic program of T cell exhaustion? Was this the basis for uh, the reason that these cells could not enter back into a molecular program of effector T cell response? And so to do this, we developed a technology together with 10X Genomics, uh, led by Jeff Granja, who is a former graduate student uh, at Stanford, to perform single cell, uh, to perform a taxi uh, assay for a transposase accessible chromatin of sequencing in single cells and droplets. Uh, and then perform that assay on exactly the same samples that I described to you already. Uh, and what we were uh, uh, interested to see was that exhausted T cells in a tumor microenvironment had a completely distinct epigenetic state compared to other T cells. It was not simply the upregulation of inhibitory receptors on otherwise activated T cells, in which, in which case you might think that blocking those inhibitory receptors would make them an effector cell again. Instead, uh, what it was is a complete reprogramming of the entire uh, epigenome of the cell, and exhausted T cells exhibited just as many unique regulatory elements and tra transcription factor binding sites as did any other uh, T cell subtype that we're used to thinking about, TH17 cells, uh, TFH cells, memory cells, et cetera. So they're really a distinct cell state, and uh, in subsequent work, uh, we and others have shown that there's actually a distinct lineage of cells uh, that develops uh, after uh, seeing chronic antigen. So as soon as a T cell see, begins to see chronic antigen, it uh, develops down a di distinct differentiation path of exhaustion as distinct from an effector path. Importantly, if we now looked at this data and asked where the cells, are the cells derived from a pre-therapy or post-therapy sample, what we see is that Post-therapy, the cells, the epigenetic cell state of exhausted T cells is exactly the same as pre-therapy, suggesting that exhaustion is accompanied by a stable epigenetic state that is not reversed by PD-1 blockade. Therefore, we think that PD-1 blockade does not now enable these cells to robustly enter the effector response again. So what I've shown you so far is that using clonal lineage tracing of T cells, we've shown that a large number of clonally expanded T cells post PD-1 blockade are not in the same tumor pre-therapy and that PD-1 blockade does not reinvigorate uh, exhausted T cells in the tumor microenvironment, but instead recruits a novel set of clones uh, to, to come and fight the tumor. Uh, and we think this is mediated by the development of a distinct epigenetic state that accompanies T cell exhaustion, uh, 
which underlies dysfunctional programs in the cell and is not reversed by PD-1 blockade or other checkpoint blockade agents. And so we really think that this epigenetic state of exhaustion is uh, represents a significant and long-lasting barrier to uh, and, and barrier to long-lasting immune responses to cancer or to immunotherapy. So, so based on all of that work, we have really become interested over the past several years in thinking about are there ways in which we can reverse or prevent the development of exhaustion and the development of this epigenetic state. Uh, and that might allow the window of time in which a T cell can see chronic antigen, can see tumor antigens, uh, and continue to function to be wider and, to, and thereby to uh, allow for more killing of the tumor and better responses. So before we answer that question, we wanted to, to really take a step back and ask a kind of a very simple and basic question, which is, do all T cell clones that see chronic antigen actually become exhausted? Or are there T cell clones that for some reason are able to resist exhaustion just in a normal poly, polyclonal response uh, to a chronic antigen in, 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 in any uh, immune response? Are there some clones that are able to resist the development of exhaustion? Can we learn something from that program that we can then use uh, or leverage to improve uh, immunotherapies? So to ask that question, we uh, took a step back and went to uh, the sort of classic model in which T-cell exhaustion was discovered, a chronic infection model in mice uh, called clone 13 LCMV infection. And uh, this is a useful system in that there are two viruses that are very similar in that they have the same epitopes that are recognized by T cells, but one virus uh, due to some uh, changes in its genome is actually lasts much longer and is not cleared by the immune system. Uh, and this is the clone 13 LCMV virus. Uh, but that allows us to track antigen specific T cell responses in uh, both an acute infection in which the infection is resolved, as well as in a chronic infection uh, that is uh, derived or, or presents the same antigens that are recognized by the same T cells. So what I'm showing you on the top is a, a single cell atlas, multi-omic atlas of early and late acute infection and chronic infection. Uh, and so what you're seeing on the top left is about 200,000 single cells, again, paired RNA and TCR sequencing. The top of the UMAP is cells that are uh, largely derived from acute infection. So in the blue, uh, you see uh, effector cells, and then in the orange, you see memory cells. So this is what normally happens in acute infection or acute T cell response. What you can see on the, on the right is clonal expansion of cells in the setting of chronic infection. And what you can see is that the phenotypes of clonally expanded cells in chronic infection or during the development of exhaustion is, as you might expect, very distinct from what happens in acute infection. Uh, what you see is um, a number of cell states that are that are um, uh, that start with that have been described by others in the field, but now we can really see their differentiation trajectory, starting with this earliest state of exhaustion, which is the so-called progenitor exhausted cell, a transitory cell that has some effector function, but then quickly develops into a terminally exhausted uh, cell that. Uh, has the upregulation and expression of all of the inhibitory receptors that we've talked about. What we can now do is look at the clonal level and ask of clonally expanded cells that are antigen specific in acute or chronic infection, and in particularly now in the chronic infection, are there clones that can, that do not enter this typical terminally exhausted state, but now enter a distinct state, perhaps an effector like state? So what I'm showing you here are bar plots where each bar represents a single clone. So all of the cells in that bar plot have the same TCR alpha beta sequence. And then the color represents the phenotypes of the cells in, those, in that clone. So what you can see in an acute infection is early during infection at day eight, all of the cells are effector cells. Late, they develop into memory. That's what's expected. In contrast, in chronic infection, early, you get the development of these progenitor exhausted cells and transitory cells. And late, most of those clones now develop into this terminally exhausted cell state. However, what we see is a few clones that look like this, which is that they are antigen specific, they're clonally expanded, but they're not entering the same state of terminal exhaustion. Instead, they're entering a state that looks a lot like an acute effector memory, a, a cell state, and these are the cells that are falling actually here. So they're neighboring 
normal affect your cells in acute infection, but are somehow uh, a bit distinct. If we take a step back and ask, what are the patterns of differentiation across thousands of clones in that data set? What we see is three primary patterns of differentiation. We see the pattern that we expected and has been described before, which is that cells that are seeing chronic antigen uh, develop into progenitor cells, then transitory intermediate cells, and then terminal exhaustion. However, that's only about half of all of the clones. The other half of the clones develop some form of this effector-like state. So either clones that develop into both terminally exhausted uh, as well as an effector-like state, which we're calling a KLR state because they express these uh, lectin receptors, uh, or clones that actually avoid exha terminal exhaustion altogether and only develop into this effector-like state. So this was surprising to us and we, were, we asked a, a, the question of whether this is sort of a st stochastic differentiation process or whether this might be intrinsically programmed. And if it's intrinsically programmed, that suggests that there may, may be a way for us to engineer the same outcome. And so to make a, a very long story short here, we uh, asked whether the clones that entered this effector state also entered an effector state in every organ in which we could find them across the, the body. And that might suggest that they're intrinsically programmed, right, rather than stochastically differentiated. And that is in fact the case. And uh, we uh, looked a bit deeper and asked what might be programming these cells and landed on the signal strength of the TCR signal itself as a primary driver of the differentiation pathway. Uh, and the, the point is that TCR clones and TCR sequences that have high signal strength, meaning when they see antigen, they give a big signal to the T cell, those cells uh, tend to be uh, de tend to develop into terminally exhausted cells and follow the standard exhaustion pathway. And TCRs that for, uh, 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 because of their sequence and because of their binding biophysics, give a weaker intrinsic signal, those cells uh, uh, are preferentially developing into these effector-like cell states. Uh, and then and just quickly to say that we see the same phenotypes and same patterns in uh, data from other groups in human tumors and, and tumor infiltrating T cells. So we do think this is not just something that happens in infection, but also a, but a, a broadly uh, generalizable differentiation path for exhaustion across um, both mouse and human and infection and cancer. So what I've just shown you is that in a polyclonal response, some T cells are actually able to continue to see chronic antigen, but avoid exhaustion. And so for us, this was inspiration to actually search for non-TCR targets that could lead to the same outcome. So are there genes that we can uh, delete or modify in some way that would, uh, uh, that would have the same effect on the T cell, that it could continue to see chronic antigen, but not enter terminal exhaustion? And why might this be useful? And, and uh, as we've just heard in the last talk, uh, this might be useful for combination therapy for checkpoint blockade or, 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 or their, you know, uh, 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 targeted agents towards those genetic, uh, those genes themselves, but this could also be useful for cell therapy purposes. So what you've already heard is that sort of the second pillar of, of, of modern cancer immunotherapy is the development of these chimeric antigen receptor T cells in which an antigen binding domain from an antibody is hooked to a TCR signaling domain. Uh, and that allows you to redirect a patient's own T cells against an antigen or tumor antigen of choice. Importantly, what uh, Crystal Makel's group and uh, other groups have shown several years ago is that CAR T cells also become exhausted. And this makes sense, right? A CAR T cell will also see, receive chronic antigen stimulation as it fights a tumor. And over time, uh, largely the same, same process, although, there's the, although there are some distinctions, uh, largely the same molecular process will happen in CAR T cells leading to uh, epigenetic uh, exhaustion. So we could imagine that if we can now screen for genes that could improve a T cell response, that these could be engineered into some of these exciting cell therapy uh, products that are now being developed for patients. So this was led by a, a graduate student, Julia Belk, who performed um, both in vitro and in vivo genome-wide uh, iterative screens for uh, genes that could allow a T cell to resist or, or, or uh, prevent exhaustion. Uh, and I won't take you through the methods but the, the, uh, or the systems, but there was an in vitro system shown on the top, which is chronic stimulation with antigen mimicking what happens in vivo. And then we also did screens in, in vivo tumor bearing mice. Uh, 
Importantly, the, what really enabled the genome-wide screens was the development of this in vitro assay, which was really pioneered by Santosh Vardhana at MSK. Uh, and what we showed is that the epigenetic state of in vitro chronically stimulated T cells seemed to uh, reflect or mirror what we were seeing in vivo and what I've already described to you in here. I'm just showing you chromatin accessibility at a set of uh, regulatory elements associated with exhaustion. And you can see that over the time course of in vitro exhaustion, you get chromatin, new chromatin accessibility of all of the same elements that you see in exhaustion in vivo. So Julia performed a genome-wide screen and what I'm showing you um, here are the in vitro results. So the top 100 hits of the genome-wide screen uh, categorized by their um, presumed protein-protein interactions. And what you see as the positive control is TCR signaling. So we're inducing uh, exhaustion using a TCR signal. So if you knock out those molecules or signaling molecules, uh, you resist exhaustion, the T cells persist longer. Um, but what we were surprised to see is really this large enrichment of epigenetic factors, uh, including very general epigenetic factors, BAF complex members, ion 80 nucleosome remodeling complex uh, factors, and, and also a number of transcription factors. And so again, if we deleted these genes in vitro in T cells and chronically stimulated them, the cells would last much longer and were able to maintain their effector function much longer. We performed iterative screens uh, in vivo in a number of tumor models. And you can imagine that the, buyer, the, the bar is much higher in, in vivo. T cells actually have to recognize antigen, infiltrate the tumor, resist the tumor microenvironment, suppressive factors, kill the tumor and persist. So there are many more steps that an in vivo T cell has to take compared to an in vitro T cell. Um, but a number of these hits did uh, continue to improve uh, T cell function in vivo, and in particular, members of the BAF complex, in particular, ARID1A. We we're able to really uh, build on the work of Sigal Kadosh and, and several others who, and Jerry Crabtree and several others who have described the modules or the complexes of BAF uh, activity and BAF, BAF, BAF function, in particular, identifying these three complexes, canonical BAF complex, PBAF, and NCBAF, and performing a small-scale uh, screens of all of the BAF complex members to identify what was really the molecular logic of genes that we could delete that would improve T cell function. And so what you can see on the bottom is uh, cartoons of the various BAF complex modules and uh, colored by whether uh, the deletion of those genes improved T cell function or not. If they did, they're red. And so what you can see is that largely members of the canonical BAF complex and largely uh, 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 proteins that are replaceable by other subunits uh, were hits in the screen, suggesting that uh, it's really the canonical BAF complex that's uh, inducing exhaustion and that, or playing a role in inducing exhaustion, and that we're not really completely ablating CBAF from the chromatin, but we're somehow reducing uh, or tuning the amount of CBAF on chromatin. And then if we look at the epigenetic state of these chronically stimulated T cells after ARID1A or CBAF, uh, other uh, deletion of other CBAF complex members, what we see is that we do not now get a new chromatin accessibility of elements associated with T cell exhaustion, and that these elements are uh, associated with an enrichment of binding sites for AP1 factors in particular, which have been shown by other groups to really be a driving force in developing T cell exhaustion. So we also wanted to, so, you know, that's great. We, the T cells last longer. If they see chronic antigen, they can survive in the setting of, 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 of developing exhaustion. They can resist the epigenetic state of exhaustion, but actually, are they actually functioning better? Uh, are they entering the tumor and um, uh, secreting uh, effector molecules and actually killing the tumor, right? And that's what we're after. And so to ask this question, we performed an in vivo perturb seek experiment in which we're uh, putting small pools of sgRNAs onto T cells, injecting them in vivo, and then pulling them out and amplifying both the sgRNA and the transcriptome of each of these cells. So we, we did this uh, for about 70,000 cells and then grouped the cells by which perturbation they received, which is shown on the, in the heat map on the bottom left. And so what you can immediately see is that perturbation of ARID1A or other CBAF complex members, uh, SMARC C1, SMARC D2, had a largely similar effect on the transcriptome and that this was distinct from perturbation of PD-1, for example. So these are, these are doing different things. And in particular, what you see is upregulation of a number of effector molecules, uh, including uh, uh, cytokines, chemokines, and uh, interferon, TNF, and others. And if we now map this signature onto the phenotypes I just showed you, uh, 
uh, in the co context of LCMV, what you see is that they're enriched in this effector-like KLR uh, 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 TX, uh, uh, exhausted T-cell state. So what we think is happening is that by deleting ARID1A and CBAF complex members, we're able to achieve a similar outcome phenotypically as what we see in those clones that have low affinity or low avidity TCRs. And then finally, if we inject these uh, CBAF depleted or ARID1A depleted uh, T cells into tumor bearing mice, they are able to persist longer in vivo and are able to more effectively clear tumor uh, uh, in, in the mice. It's important to say that these mice aren't cured of the tumor. So eventually after you know, 30 days or something, they do start, the tumors do start to grow out. So what we think is happening is that we are extending the time in which a T cell can see chronic antigen uh, without undergoing this epigenetic reprogramming and uh, chromatin and inducing chromatin accessibility of dysfunctional, uh, dysfunction driving regulatory elements. So what I've shown you in the second part is that we've used clonal T cell analysis to identify really divergent uh, differentiation pathways in the setting of chronic antigen stimulation and T cell exhaustion, and really been inspired by that to look for genetic uh, uh, hits or genetic mo uh, uh, modifiers, modifications that we can make that really uh, mimics the same process of, of uh, avoiding terminal exhaustion or extending the window in which a, a cell can see antigen and, and, and get terminally exhausted. And I think this has a number of impl impl implications for cancer immunotherapy, obviously for the engineering of cell therapies. And I think there are gonna be many uh, other genes and there are many other groups working on identifying pathways to improve uh, the uh, efficacy and persistence and function of, of CAR T cells and other cell therapies. But I think this could also have potential for, for combination therapies for checkpoint blockade, for example, combining uh, epigenetic targeting agents uh, or chromatin targeting agents with, with immunotherapies that are currently on the market. So thank you for your attention. What I've tried to show you is, is really the many ways in which we're trying to use high throughput genome sequencing and single cell technologies to really understand fundamental aspects of how how T cells function and how they uh, they can be effective and can be improved uh, for the purpose of treating cancer patients. This was really a lot of work by a lot of people. Uh, many thanks to all of our wonderful collaborators uh, and and wonderful members of the lab who've really driven this work forward. Thank you, and happy to take any questions if we have time for that. Thank you so much, Ansuman. This was great, and it's really fascinating work.